is Amarjot Singh, and I regularly uh, read cases on Canley and Federal Court website to look at the causes of refusal of different categories. And one of the cases which I'm going to present to you is uh, about a gentleman who came from a different country from Pakistan uh, and what happened to him and uh, all the way from his journey from initially all the way till uh, till judicial review. And I have the pair with me, uh, Paul Briggs, uh, uh, who actually represented him at the judicial review at the, at the end of this uh, timeline. So I welcome Paul to the discussion. But before I ask Paul uh, some questions, I want to uh, tell uh, the general public about what really happened in this case. So I'm going to bring this case on the screen so that people can follow up. Uh, and uh, eventually, if you want to read this case, you can you can go to the uh, uh, federal court website. And this is the you know here it is. Uh, this is the citation number. You can search by Riaz Ali. It is posted on um, arrested on November 28th. So th this case is Riaz Ali. Uh, was his uh, MCI, and uh, briefly what happened is that there are about 15 pages, and I can post the link. People can read this on their own. What really happened was that uh, he got a tourist visa, and I've made some notes uh, notes here as well. He got the tourist visa in June 2019. He arrived in July here. Uh, um, as soon as he arrived here, he contacted some immigration consultant for getting him a work permit. He wanted to work. I think he was a chef there in his country, and uh, the LMIA was uh, was approved uh, in December 2019. After about six months from from <coughs> arrival into Toronto, uh, he was asked by the first consultant to go and leave leave the country, go back to Pakistan, and then re-enter. I I don't understand why he did that, but uh, you know uh, this is what had really happened. So he left the country, he re-entered Canada. Uh, when he came to the port of entry, he showed his LMIA to the to the CBSA and demanded a work permit. And CBSA rightfully said no. Sorry, this is not the uh, this is not the this, there's no approval of the application. Or he should have applied from overseas or at least within Canada when he was here. Uh, so he was asked to leave. He signed and he left. Uh, so uh, this was on. Uh, January 30th, 2020, work permit was filed without. OK, and then when he when he again went back to. Um, uh, went back to uh, Pakistan, I think uh, he filed the work permit again uh, from there uh, and the work permit was filed online, but the application was uh, sent to the visa office in, I think, Poland and the Poland uh, visa office uh, told this guy that uh, there is a possible misrepresentation because of mismatch of the facts of the previous refusal, earlier refusal, which he, they, he did not declare or the consultant did, did not declare somebody. And uh, but the but the second consultant in Pakistan said, oh, look, this <laughs> this email is fake, I think just ignore uh, and there's no need to respond to the procedure fairness letter. And uh, lo and behold, within about. I think 10 days or so they were he was deemed misrepresentation. Uh, he was, you know, for five year ban and uh, somebody asked him to uh, after this misrep, somebody asked him, somebody asked this guy to have his decision reconsidered. The reconsideration itself was also refused and now eventually he landed to judicial review, which is the subject of our discussion. Paul, is my history OK for so far? Well, there's a few details that uh, are not quite accurate. Uh, we okay. can go into them if you want. I I was the per, I was the lawyer that acted for him on the reconsideration first of all, so I know quite a bit about the underlying facts. If you want me to go through them in a bit Please. more detail, Please. so so let me just say this for your audience, and uh, I say this to all my clients. Um, Mr. A Mr. Ali really didn't do anything wrong, and this is what is so frustrating with these kinds of cases. He actually was had an engineering background in Pakistan. No uh, problems with immigration refusals. Uh, I think he had one issue with the U.S. at some point, <clears throat> but nothing, no problems. He went to a consultant in Islamabad who actually got him a four year multiple entry visa for Canada, which is by no means an easy thing to get for any national. Um, and so he had a certain trust for this person. This person was not a registered consultant. 
Um, but in any case, uh, most people don't know that. They don't check the fine print. Uh, so he comes to Canada and, uh, and he journeys around, lands in Toronto, uh, goes to Calgary, meets a friend. Friend says, well, if you want to stay, I can get you a job as a pizza chef. He'd actually been a chef at a four-star restaurant in, his, in uh, Karachi. Um, and so he said, sure, I kind of like it here. And so he went to a lawyer first and a consultant, helped him get the LMIA. And according to Mr. Ali, the consultant said, that's all you need to get back into Canada. He had to leave because... His visa for entry time was up. <clears throat> I think it was 12 months that he had to leave, and uh, and he he could come back because he had a multiple entry visa. But he but he but the visa for that particular visit was up, and so he went. Uh, and of course, he spent a month in January in in uh, Pakistan, and then he just came back waving his uh, LMIA acceptance, following his consultant's advice, which was completely negligent. So he just he doesn't know. <clears throat> Most people don't. They they trust what people tell them. Even a even a professional person like Mr. Ali. So he comes in, and of course the border services officer says, "Well, where's your work permit?" And he says, "Well, I thought you're going to give me one." And he says, "Well, no. Um, you know, you need one. You have to get one. That's not enough." And so he was actually detained at the airport for like two days, at the great cost to himself, had to buy a ticket right then and there back to Karachi, which is, as you and a few of your listeners know, not cheap. And um, and he turned him around. They just withdrawal of entry. So he goes back to Mr. Rahman, who was the consultant in this case, and he says, look, I need a work permit. And so Mr. Rahman says, okay, sure. Uh, you know, he had all, he had the file already. So he emails him all the stuff, does his work permit, does the online portal application. And, uh, and he uploads it. And of course, um, the key with the case, and unfortunately why I lost the case, in my view anyway, was um, he said, Mr. Ali said he actually didn't uh, get a chance to review the application, but he signed he signed some documents um, later, or he was given the documents later, after it was uploaded to the portal. And, uh, and unfortunately, Mr. Rahman did not take great care in, in, in doing those documents and, and did not put the most recent deemed refusal of entry in, which had just happened a month before. <laughs> so, um, and fortunately at the judicial review stage, um, Mr. Ali did not say, hey, wh why didn't, he didn't read the documents carefully. Most people don't read it. They just trust, hey, it's all the same information. Nothing's changed, so it's gonna be the same. And so he didn't notice that the the box that you tick on the work permit application, which is the same in all general applications, which is have you ever been refused entry to Canada, was no, which of course is the problem. It's not no, it should be yes, and then you explain everything. So anyway, it was uploaded, and, and that's when uh, the uh, CIC Abu Dhabi, who did the review, who did the review of the, those permits, said, uh, well, hey, uh, we look like it might be a misrep. So they gave him a fairness letter, which is part of immigration's process, as you may know and people know, which is um, if you do a little boo-boo and you don't quite do things right, there is this fairness process. And that's why it was brought in years ago is uh, we have a fairness. We give you one chance to explain yourself because, you know, if it's just a little mistake, then we don't want to have people refused. So anyway, um, he's now in Saudi Arabia on a Hajj, and um, he gets this email from Warsaw. And most people might think it's kind of weird. Why is it coming from Warsaw when it was supposed to be dealt with in Abu Dhabi? But but the CIC shuffles around their work. And uh, Warsaw has always been a place where <clears throat> they do the overloads. So he then forwards it to his consultant and says, well, look, uh, here's this fairness letter. What do I do? And the consultant and I, I filed the actual video, the actual audio recordings from the consultant in this case with both CIC Abu Dhabi and the court, where he's saying in uh, it's Hindi or Urdu, he says, uh, it's fake. Don't, don't, don't uh, pay any attention to it. We get lots of these, it's all fake. And so he doesn't do anything. And so he doesn't respond to the fairness letter until the next, of course, if you don't respond to the fairness letter, the visa uh, officer refused the visa. So a little while later, he hires me. And I, and I actually file a long affidavit explaining everything I've just told you, 
And I've, I got an affidavit from Mr. Rahman saying he was negligent. He shouldn't have said that. And all the video recordings with proper translations. And I gave it all to the visa officer. It took a year. It was COVID time, June 20th, 2020. So everything was all limited. It took a year to get back to me. And I had to make multiple requests saying, please give me an answer to this. I want, I want it reconsidered. I think this is an exceptional case. He's been denied fairness. It's not his fault. And so that's the decision I judicially reviewed in the summer of June, July 2021. I, um, I finally got a response and it was a one line response saying, we don't see any error of fact in law. One line response yeah. after a huge package was sent to them after a year. And so it was even worse than that. That's indicated in the decision. It says, and if you were, we're going to think about reconsidering, but if you don't hear from us, then this is your, this is your, this is your final decision. And it's like, well, okay, well, you've taken a year to get back to me just to, just to respond. So how long do I wait? As some of your listeners might know, it's a 60 day judicial review time period, uh, uh, for out of uh, out of country decisions, overseas decisions. So I waited two months, and I I I I basically waited actually longer, and I filed an FOI request, thinking maybe I'd get the decision that way. Long story short, uh, I finally made a complaint to the privacy commissioner because I never got anything from anybody. In January 2021, I finally got them to give me the decision, and that's the decision that I I judicially reviewed, and I applied for extension of time, which was granted. So. Long story to now Justice Ahmad's de decision, which I'm disappointed in, but I understand why he thought he needed to make it, um, because in the area of misrepresentation, this is really a cautionary tale. Everybody who applies to Canada, whoever you hire, and please ensure that the person you hire has some either is accredited with the, with the immigration consultancies or is a lawyer, a Canadian immigration lawyer who knows what they're doing, and read your documents. Because if you, if you just trust anybody, I thought this was an exceptional case. And the, the problem I have with Justice Ahmad's decision, he, didn't tell, he, doesn't, he doesn't refer to any of those facts in this decision. He, just, he, just, he, basically, he basically did something which I was concerned that he would do, I'm not necessarily criticizing him, and many judges would do the same thing, is that he didn't find any problem with the original decision. And of course, the original decision's fine because <laughs> there was a misrep and the original visa officer was right possibly to refuse. Um, but I just thought because he was not given procedural fairness because he never got an opportunity in this particular fax to actually respond to the fairness letter because he was, to, you know, because he was given bad advice, I thought it was unfair, and that's why I thought the court would step in. But Justice Ahmad did not take that opportunity to um, to actually find that this was a situation that was exceptional. Because generally speaking, it's always been the law for the past 15 years. And there's been other cases similar to this where fraudulent consultants, consultants who've been convicted of fraud, have given bad advice to their clients, and the court says, so I'm sorry, but, you know, you're responsible, even if your consultant is fraudulent, you're responsible for the information you give us. And, you know, I understand the policy reason for that for that reasoning is, well, if everybody who wanted to come to Canada just said they blamed somebody else, then we just have hundreds of these applications. But there are there are and has always been a line of cases which are exceptional cases in misrepresentation type cases, because. The problem is, is that the penalty is really um, onerous. Like he, he cannot, a, a perfectly good person, very qualified. We want to have these kind of people in Canada. Um, great background, um, can 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 um, provide lots of um, um, support to uh, the employment situation in Canada. Are now no longer able to come to Canada. In this case, for five years and maybe forever, because after you get one bad mark against you, you often have a great difficult time getting into Canada. In this, in, in Mr. Ali's case, he, he now can't come to Canada for five years from 2020, which is when he got the exclusion order. Because misrep always um, results in an exclusion order, um, it's a serious consequence to what really was just a tiny little mistake, which can often be innocent. He, had, he didn't have any intention to lie to anybody. It was never his intention to cover anything up. 
I mean, he really did nothing wrong other than you can't trust anybody. It's your documents and you have to read them and you have to make sure what you're being told is correct. And it, it really is a sad tale. And I thought that um, Justice Ahmad would take this case and maybe take it in a different direction, but basically he didn't. So uh, Ms. Rep is a tough is a tough one, but that's so that's the background. That's the background. OK, can I can I start from start from uh, from beginning to to reflect on what could have happened if he had proper advice? So as you as you said, by by great uh, fortune, he got the tourist visa from Pakistan, which is very difficult for people to get just to visit Canada. They it's not it's not uh, common or it's not very easy to get that. But he got the visa. He arrived. He arrived in Canada. Uh, if he was issued six months stay, was he issued six months stay or three months stay? I think three months, and then he and then he applied three for renewal. Stay. I have to double check, but. Uh... Uh, if he if he got he got the LMIA within that three months or or uh, it was later than three no, months. No, no, no. It was uh, he didn't get the LMIA. I think he landed. You said June. Uh, is that that? I I don't have I don't have I don't have. A I, I, I have I have the dates. I have me, the but... dates. I have the dates here. So the the TRB was issued in June. He arrived in July of 2019. July of 2019. Yes, that's right. And. Uh, and then the LMIA was issued in November or December because I know that he waited in Calgary for two months for um, the LMIA to be issued. Yeah, what I'm what I'm just thinking is this. Uh, he could have easily filed extension of status, change of status from visitor to worker based on approved LMIA within Canada itself. He could have. Why, why why didn't anybody think I mean they're, they're consulting somebody nobody gave him the proper advice if he would have and people do this all the time today uh, they come on the pretext of visiting here they find a job and then they convert from extension of status it's an online application it just hardly takes uh, you know well, not uh, only not only do they do it all the time it's one of the best ways to do it because it's so hard to get a job from outside of Canada because you haven't met anybody so the better Absolutely. thing to do and why the visitor visa has always been hard to get is because Canadian, the, the immigration knows once they get here, they can meet people and then they can get a support for the job, which which they do all the time. So I totally agree with you. So the first the first mistake that that could have been uh, avoided all this mess is was that the, the first consultant should have converted his status from visitor status to uh, work permit status within Canada, and that could have put him into an implied status and there was no need for him to go. Uh, on the contrary, he asked him to leave Canada, go back to Pakistan, and then re-enter, which which is defies my imagination. Uh, re-enter for what? I mean, obviously the first consultant did not know anything about, uh, you know, status change or status extension. Nothing. He asked him to go, and nonetheless, if he if he re-entered Canada after I think a month or so. Uh, he is showing the CBSA, the LMIA itself. There's no application under process, either outside or inside, that shows that the IRCC has approved for the work visa itself. And that is a that is again is a that shows lack of knowledge or uh, lack of uh, uh, professional expertise by the first consultant who did not know exactly what uh, what they were trying to do. Nonetheless, that is a mistake number two. Uh, the work permit. Uh, when it was filed from Pakistan by consultant number two, uh, no, no, no matter how innocent it looks like, but eventually, and that has been the jurisprudence all along, that the applicant is responsible for what goes in the file. Whether yep. it's, it is done by the lawyer, it is done by the travel agent, it is done by the ghost consultant, it is done by a brother, it is done by a dog, and no, does not matter. As long as you put your sign on it, you better take responsibility. Whatever happens, it's consequences on you. So uh, he well, he, well, even if you he, don't put your signature on it, because as you know, on the online course. world, they don't even have they don't even require a signature. You can yeah. just have your representative upload it. So yeah. you're still responsible for what goes what goes in the application. And and perhaps uh, there was wasn't there a mention where where he was told by the second consultant to come and do some fingerprints or some uh, medical or something. And I'm wondering yeah, what, what he did. He did. What do you need fingerprints for? Well, biometrics, but I, I would assume he'd already had those done. I don't know why he needed to do it there again. Was, but there, there was when the application was already filed itself, the fingerprint would have been done at the first visa with the TRV six months or one year ago. 
All right. So this is this is just a charade of uh, asking the clients, hey, come on in. We are working on the file. Let's do some fingerprints. So the client knows that something is happening and maybe medical or something. Or so that was a mistake. Number two, the third yeah. mistake is the third mistake is, you know, whenever a procedure friend, I have done hundreds of PFL letters and we have one cases just by writing letters. I did not even have to proceed to GR. I, uh, you know, the, the procedure fairness letter is is a, is a uh, I, I'm not saying it is an easy job, but it is quite convenient for him to have explained his situation here in the PFL letter. Had it had it not for the consultant to know, hey, this is a fake email. Come on, when this when the, some consultant thinks that this is a fake email, that tells you you got to run. You know, this is this is not going to happen. <laughs> so yeah, maybe. no, I I agree with you. I I just couldn't believe it. But but normally I don't have uh, I don't have that kind of evidence because I just have the client telling me that he was told something and they had a conversation. In this case, I actually had his phone call <laughs> to my client and he recorded it, saying that I had the I had the advice on audio and I provided it to the uh, to immigration. So I agree with you. It's um it's a problem. Uh, yeah, it's a problem. So, so you, you, uh, there was a reference to a case. Uh, let me show you on the screen. Uh, I think there was a similar case where uh, the justice uh, Emmett. Uh, uh, I'll show you on the screen. I think you can see. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the applicant in Hagigat uh, uh, also same same situation consultant never provided her with the pfl letter that gave her opportunity to respond and my colleague justice manson found that these circumstances were unfortunate this does not absolve the applicant of the consequences so no matter the as far as misrep is concerned they have a very rigid uh, uh, attitude over you know it does not matter whether the council was incompetent or they forgot or it was uh, the email went into the spam or uh, you know, I lost my keys or the mailbox. You know, nothing will fly. I mean, uh, well, well, if you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right when you say that. And Hajidat is, is particularly onerous because the the the, fraud, the consultant in that case was actually convicted of fraud. But um, it's it's the problem is I I tried to argue um, there is there is an exception. Um, in misrep, but it's related to refugee or inland cases where mm -hmm. uh, a person does say something that is an innocent mistake or whatever. There's an, or, or has, has said one thing on a prior application and saying another thing in another application. If they're given professionally negligent advice and that's shown, then they've been denied procedural, procedural unfairness. And that has actually those cases have actually been successful. But those only applied to the immigration tribunals that I found. I didn't find any that had applied over to overseas visa offices. So I was I wanted to, I tried to extend the law. I tried to extend the that 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 principle to overseas visa decisions, and unfortunately, Justice Ahmad did not want to go there. <laughs> That's right. So That's right. so so you're right. Everything you said is is completely correct, and uh, and. Uh, it is in some ways you could even say it's, it's a it's it seems really unfair if you've actually been the victim of a of a negligent consultant but that's the law that's the law right now anyway i want to touch upon the the uh, the concept of reconsideration uh, okay. uh whether it's er error or fact of law i have a uh, uh, few examples but i can tell you that i won reconsideration um, you know approval uh, when when they're talking about error of fact or law, uh, in this in this particular case, uh, the visa office said uh, to my client that um, you did not provide, uh, you do not have funds for that. You know you lack financial ability to do this, like study visa. I mean, uh, and I challenged them and I and I told them, look, uh, the the bank statement was uploaded. And the bank statement was included. You may have forgotten to look at the bank statement. So, within about seven to seven business days, they reversed the decision, and then they made from, uh, you know, disapproval to approval. So that's uh, like a, like a, when you can prove it to them that this this was an error of fact that they made. Uh, that is what it is. But in this case, uh, the 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 PFL was uh, well founded. 
the 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 lack of response to PFL was well founded. So there was there is absolutely no way they could have reconsidered at all. And uh, as you as you said, the justice also uh, they they uh, they you know they gave full deference to the earlier decision not to under not to continue it all the way that we will we can substitute that decision. So um, yeah, I mean, and that's and that's why and that's really the. That's really the crux of the decision. Um, he he decided that because there really had been no problem with the earlier decision and the process from the government's perspective, he didn't find it was a case that he should intervene or he could intervene uh, in terms of any errors. Uh, so again, uh, my argument on that was that he'd been denied actually procedural unfairness, but again, he didn't accept that argument. So. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. Reconsideration, I do it all the time. Many lawyers do. We, it, it's 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 much cheaper than going to judicial review route, which is expensive. It takes forever, and a quick uh, a quick call to the program manager or make some submissions and fix up a document like you just uh, suggested. Done all the time, all the time. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it, there's limits, <laughs> and, and yeah. this is one of those limits. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, nice talking to you, Paul, and uh, I'll uh, yeah. stay in touch with you. If you have more cases that you handle, whether they've been approved or not, if you can share with me, I can I can pass them and then I can bring them on. Uh, do you want to leave your phone number or so just in case if somebody wants to contact you for uh, potential JR with their own applications? Yes, absolutely. I, I'm found on the web, paulbriggslawyer.com, and uh, you can get a hold of me through that site, uh, 604-288-8686. If anybody has any uh, questions or needs a JR, I'm happy to help. All right. And thanks, and for thank your, thanks, for, thanks for reaching out. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye. Okay, bye-bye. <clears throat>